Tenokuri. Bigger, cooler, jogger. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our panel, the first panel after the lunch break. So I guess we had a very good lunch and hope we, will, we already got a good stamina for uh, this afternoon uh, debate, because we have uh, an important uh, topic on the agenda. It's actually one thing that uh, we, Romania, have in common with our friends uh, uh, from the Balkan region, which is the gastronomy and the uh, uh, food part. Uh, today, uh, we have a panel entitled The Balkans at the Crossroads, Stability or a New Crisis, organized on the uh, Black Sea and Balkan Sec Security Forum by the New Strategy Center, and this panel in particular in partnership with Belgrade Center for Security Policy Serbia. Uh, my name is Robert Lupizzo, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Cale Europeana da Pro, the main EU and transatlantic affairs media outlet in Romania, and it is my pleasure and my honor to moderate this, uh, this discussion. Uh, we have together with us uh, Mr. Jordan Bozilov, President Sofia Security Forum Bulgaria, Mr. Bojan Elek, Deputy Director Belgrade Center for Security Policy Serbia, and Mr. James Go, Professor James Go, Department of War Studies, King's College UK. And uh, on a video message, we'll, uh, we will be joined by Mr. Manuel Sarazin, Special Representative for the countries of the Western Balkans of the Federal Government of, uh, of Germany. Uh, there is a lot to, to discuss about the Western Balkans, including in, in the context of uh, Russia's illegal war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we have a lot going on. Uh, we had a 2022 year very, very important uh, for the Western Balkans with the Tirana summit, where we had the, the declaration of the, of the Tirana summit concerning the EU enlargement and EU's relation with the Western Balkans and also the European perspectives and aspirations of the Western Balkans. Um, and we will have uh, a lot to discuss about that. Uh, of course, also about the influence of Russia and China in the region, about the difficult issues between Serbia and, uh, and Kosovo, uh, and also about the, the role that, let's say, the new European political community could have for the relationship between the European Union and Western Balkans. Uh, I would like, first of all, to uh, have for the first, uh, first part of our debate uh, the video message of uh, Mr. Manuel Sarazin, the special representative for the Western Balkans from the federal uh, government of, uh, of Germany. And I will ask the colleagues from the, organ uh, from the organizing team to help us with the video message, please. Good day, dear colleagues. To Bucharest. Unfortunately, this time I was not able to join the Black Sea and Balkan Security Forum in Bucharest. It would be a pleasure to be there with you, especially as we see today that with the Russian big invasion war in Ukraine, Black Sea became a hot topic for NATO and for European Union, not only in political but also in security dimension. And the Western Balkans are actually the same. And I think it's a good idea to bring also both regions together and debates on those regions together. And I think that Bucharest is a good place to do so. And uh, yeah, it will be a major task for us to push back uh, the Russian uh, interest, try right, to be exploited as well in the Black Sea region, as well in the Western Balkans. So I've been asked in preparation for this panel to give a short view on my assumption on Seitenwende on the Western Balkans, I can say that when we uh, in the German new traffic light coalition uh, after the last elections in 21, uh, we're discussing the coalition treaty. We already decided to put Western Balkans as a strategic main focal point of our foreign and European policy in the agenda. This was before the big war uh, of aggression started in Ukraine the big invasion war of February 22, but the strategic outlook was already clear. Europe needs to be even more engaged 
and even more clear about the perspective of the Western Balkan to the European Union. So this side and vendor, this became even more obvious, but it's still the same that European Union, European perspective and credibility of European enlargement are at the core, at the center of all political, but also of all security dimensions of the region. European Union is the one scope we are pushing for. But of course, we were also trying to be more clear about, okay, there are Russian interests in the region, not only Russian, but also Russian. And uh, we were doing and pursuing policies also in the security area to be more clear. And I think that it's quite clear that, for example, the German engagement in KFO, but also the re-engagement in EU4 was showing this, but also our um, uh, readdressed commitment regarding European enlargement shown, for example, by the travels of Chancellor Scholz and Foreign Minister Baerbock to the region and our day-by-day -day engagement trying to bring the region more close to the European Union. For this, I think also well in process is the big summit last November in Berlin and the next summit coming up in October in Tirana is the key point actually also for stability and security in the region. We are trying to exploit the potential of regional cooperation binding the region as a region of the six together, but not only together under the six, but also on a clear scope towards the European Union, towards European Aki, and towards binding also the six more close together with us. If you ask me about Serbia, Kosovo, and the strategic outlook uh, in this perspective, I think it's quite clear that usually you would say bilateral issues should not be part of European enlargement. But of course, since the beginning uh, of uh, the enlargement process with Serbia and Kosovo, it was clear that having it in Chapter 35 for Serbia embedded, but also being clear to the Kosovo that uh, the way to European Union is only going via the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, this is a different situation. So I think it's quite clear that regatta, merit-based uh, approach is still valid for them. But it's also clear that you also need to get merit on normalization um, before you can have actually in the end a joining to the European Union, which is valid for both. So this is my view, and I hope that you will have good discussions coming up in Bucharest, and I hope that next year I will be able to join you live in beautiful Romania. Molto mesca. We would like to thank Mr. Sarazin for his uh, for his message. Uh, I think we all remember that uh, um, last year when everyone was speaking, of course, naturally about Ukraine, and uh, while also Romania, for instance, was supporting the, Re the Republic of Moldova, there was Germany uh, that spoke a lot about the Western Balkans, and Chancellor Scholz uh, mentioned that uh, the, in the European integration of the Western Balkans is a key task for the future of the European uh, Union. Uh, I would like now to come back to the, to the hall, to the stage, and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Jordan Bozilov, President uh, Sofia Security F uh, Forum Bulgaria, uh, for his um, first, uh, first uh, re remarks to this debate. Uh, please, Jordan, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be among uh, this audience and discuss. Uh, future uh, integration of uh, Western Balkans into European Union because I do believe that uh, uh, it is a must. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have other ch choices but to integrate Western Balkans uh, in, in uh, uh, European Union. And uh, I do believe that uh, the war in Ukraine will be a catalyst of uh, many processes, uh, including the integration of the Western Balkans uh, uh, in EU. Um, uh, we have to understand that uh, Russia's uh, invasion in Ukraine, uh, it's a shift in the geopolitical situation. Uh, it shapes the geopolitical landscape and uh, uh, make um, more and more people think that uh, it is in the EU's strategic interest uh, to have stable and secure environment. And this perception should go uh, beyond um, the uh, the idea of uh, who will be next uh, in, uh, in the EU. So uh, for the EU, uh, it is important to find the right balance between its own security uh, and integrity. 
and from other side uh, uh, to speed up the accession process for candidate countries, uh, which of course uh, uh, will, will mean more security for the EU. And on the other side, uh, having in mind the current aggressive Russia, uh, there should be no uh, gray zones. Uh, I mean, uh, we should not allow Russia uh, to freely decide the destiny of different peoples. And from this perspective, I think that EU should reconsider its uh, strategic approach uh, to security, how EU uh, defines its security. Uh, and of course, uh, one uh, of key elements uh, uh, will be enlargement or bringing closer uh, Western Balkans uh, to the EU. And I'll uh, share some thought on, uh, on this later. But I, I do think that the Commission uh, and uh, Member States, uh, they do understand that uh, enlargement should uh, continue. Uh, and this was seen uh, from the last year's um, decision um, <coughs> to give uh, candidate uh, status uh, of Ukraine, Moldova, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, uh, but of course, it should be understood that, uh, and keep in mind that accession is a process, and it's not just a formal act. Um, uh, and uh, it is based on, on, on principles. Uh, of course, there are some nuances here, um, uh, and I think few points are important. Uh, first, it is the readiness of the candidate countries themselves. I mean, preparation from the membership is something, uh, sometimes a long process uh, based on uh, different criteria, uh, and it should be clear that criteria, criteria must be met. And the second question is, of course, related to the readiness. Uh, readiness of the union to accept new member states. Um, and uh, to me, uh, this is something obscure, at least uh, for the time being. Uh, integration of the Western Balkans uh, in general appeared to be something easy before Ukraine was uh, invited. And uh, uh, why? Why I think uh, it is uh, uh, true. First, Ukraine is a huge country with 40 million people and uh, very big agriculture, uh, with very big agricultural production. So, when Ukraine will become a member state, this means that the focus of the decision making will be shifted and a lot of resources uh, which are now going to different countries will go to, to Ukraine, mainly in the agricultural sector. Um, I think that <clears throat> uh, uh, several countries have already uh, made clear that before next uh, round of enlargement uh, uh, takes steps, there should be change of the treaties in order to reflect all these uh, challenges. Uh, I, uh, Olaf Scholz uh, recently mentioned uh, this. Uh, France is also insisting on change of mechanism. Uh, mechanism the un union is, uh, is government. So there are still many unknowns about the institutional changes and what uh, enlargement mechanisms um, uh, will look, look, look like uh, after that. And here, of course, come some other issues about uh, differentiation of the union or different circles uh, of integration. So we have to define it uh, uh, once again. Um, it is important to recognize that after the invasion of Russia in Ukraine, uh, we are in a completely different security environment. Uh, and that is why you, you need a um, kind of strategic approach, not just to focus uh, on everyday functioning, uh, and this applies also to, to an enlargement. Uh, uh, we, we have to understand that it is an extraordinary situation and we have to start thinking out of the box. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we have to find uh, a mechanisms in order to accommodate uh, from one side uh, the wish of uh, the candidate uh, countries and of course some policies, constraints, uh, etc., uh, in the EU member states. Uh, but uh, answering to the question of the topic of the panel, um, uh, whether B Balkans are on the, on the crossroad, I don't think Balkans are on the crossroad uh, in terms of choosing uh, their path of development. And uh, it is only one model for them uh, uh, which is represented I mean, one model for development, which is represented by the EU countries. Um, 
uh, authoritarian uh, Russia or with no freedoms for its people is not a model. China as one party system and state capitalism, it is of course not, not, not a model for, for Western Balkans countries. And what is most, uh, what is very important is that uh, uh, the European model is uh, accepted and supported uh, by a large majority of the population uh, of uh, the aspirant countries. So what, what can be done in order to address geostrategical challenges, aspiration, uh, and of course processes uh, of uh, reconstruction or reconsideration of European Union? And I'll uh, very briefly uh, in uh, uh, my concluding, uh, in the concluding part of my presentation, I'll propose some ideas uh, uh, to be considered. Um, first, countries from the Balkans need to be included into decision-making mechanisms uh, of the European Union, especially in the spheres uh, uh, where they are affected most. And I, I would say here security and, of course, uh, migration. What are the modality of their participation in the decision-making process? We can decide uh, later. Uh, we, we should have uh, the debate. But we have to have uh, these countries participating uh, uh, with us together on the decision-making table. Second, uh, it is, uh, I think, important to give access to the aspirant countries to the EU funds uh, from the uh, beginning of their negotiations, not only after they uh, acquire a status of a member state. And I think this is very important for people because expectations are that uh, through European uh, funds, uh, through European support, these countries will uh, develop their economies and they will solve uh, many, many, many of the pending issues. Uh, on the next uh, stage, I think that um, uh, uh, we shall properly assess and appreciate every progress which is made uh, uh, by the aspirant countries. And what is very important, and I'll finish on that, uh, is to deliver to people of Western Balkans that and what the EU is doing. I think we, we have a lack of proper strategic communication. Uh, I remember um, a public opinion poll uh, in uh, Serbia several years ago, uh, which showed that majority of Serbs perceive Russia as a major uh, economic partner, totally untrue. Uh, and that is why uh, we shall be uh, more clear and explicit in uh, presenting to the public what you are doing. And uh, actually, you are doing a lot. For example, take uh, the highway, Belgrade, Belgrade niche, uh, uh, which is functioned by EU uh, funds, uh, Erasmus program, uh, connectivity, etc., etc., etc. One minute. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm closing to, 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 to my concluding uh, remarks. I mean, new strategic, strategic environment imposes on us an obligation to be more innovative, of course, without making compromises with the key principles, uh, but we have to present new solutions uh, and approaches. Uh, in order to integrate Western Balkans as soon as possible into the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for your intervention, Jordan. We will move now to Mr. Bojan Elek, Deputy Director, Belgrade Center for Security Policy, Serbia. Bojan, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, our partners from the New Strategy Center for hosting us here and for, for co-organizing this panel together with us. And we are looking forward to hosting you back in Belgrade in October when we uh, organize our Belgrade Security Conference. We will probably be able to talk about these things there as well. So um, to uh, address the main topic of the, the panel today, uh, when we speak about the stability and challenges uh, in the Western Balkans, basically two things come to mind. The war in Ukraine, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, and the spillover effects in the Balkans and the EU uh, integrations. And I will be basically talking about these two things in the next seven or eight, uh, seven or eight minutes. Uh, and I think when it comes to the spillover effect of the war, a lot of, when the war started back in February, uh, a lot of uh, media outlets ran these stories that the Balkan, the proverbial powder keg of Europe, could be the next 
region where Russia could stir up conflict in order to draw attention of the West from, from Ukraine, and there were the headlines of, you know, uh, whether the, the, the Serbia and Kosovo, for example, are on the verge of conflict. Were there, will there be some conflicts in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republic of Srpska, and so on? But uh, it's highly unlikely that this will happen. Uh, when you look at the public opinion polls that, that were done across the region of the Western Balkans, people do a higher percentage of people than before think that there might be a chance of conflict, but still overwhelming majority does not think that conflict will happen, interstate conflict between the countries in the region. And I think the most important factor that contributes to this is that the region is isolated from direct Russian presence. They can, Russia cannot deploy its capabilities because of NATO. And we have three out of six Western Balkans member, being members of NATO, and in addition to we have NATO troops present in Kosovo and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we, we are left with Serbia, the country I know best Serbia come, come from, that has the most peculiar relation with the, with, the, with the NATO, with the West, with Russia as well. And I think Serbia, not because I come from Serbia, but it, because of its position, it's the key to kind of unlocking the Western Balkans and uh, moving it from, this, uh, from, from the status quo that is taking place now. And I think the key for understanding the dynamics is understanding the, 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 the strategic interest and the role of Russia in the region. And I think it's often misunderstood especially when it comes to the relation between Serbia and Russia, because if you read the, the news, you might think that Serbia is Russia's little brother that does everything that Russia tells Serbia to do. And this is not the case, and the reality is much more complex. It is not a warm brotherly embrace between Serbia and, and Russia. It is a marriage of interest. The only strategic interest that Russia has in the region is to cause troubles to the West, and they have leverage that they use. And when it comes to Serbia, the leverage is Russia's help or support when it comes to the Kosovo issue. So Russia only has interest to cause troubles to the West by using its leverage in, in the region. And the, the main vessel for Russian influence, it's not that Russia invests hundreds of millions and has some agents there or Wagner troops. This is not what is happening in the Western Balkans. The, Russia primarily relies on local actors that are cooperative. And I'm primarily refer, referring to the Serbian government and to some other political actors in the region, primarily uh, in Republika Srpska, President uh, uh, Dodik, and uh, some political actors in Montenegro and Skopje. So Russia's uh, clout or influence in the Western Balkan region is often overestimated because it primarily relies on these local strongmen. And maybe just to illustrate this, a couple of months ago, uh, many stories around the world uh, uh, reported that, uh, many news outlets reported that Wagner opened up a recruitment center in Serbia to recruit soldiers and send it to, to, uh, to, to fight in Ukraine. And this turned out to be a false, <laughs> false news, fake news. Russia did not bother to you know, deny these stories. Why? Because it looked good, because it's all about the optics. It looked good for Russia to, yeah, they're, they're, we, we have big clout, we have allies around the world. Yeah, we recruit people in Serbia. And the Serbian president used this opportunity to deny that there is this uh, 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 recruitment center to restate, which is already known to those who follow, that foreign fighting is illegal in Serbia, you could be sentenced, sent to jail, and that already for several years this kind of outflow of uh, foreign fighters from Serbia to Ukraine, which was an issue before, had effectively stopped. So it was used by both sides um, uh, to actually, you know, for their own very specific political purposes. Uh, Serbia does have uh, Russia Today that opened a channel there, Sputnik has a channel there, but these news outlets, because they are evidently <laughs> backed by the Russian state, they need, need to put, put a little bit of makeup when they report. So they do it clandestinely and uh, in a more correct manner than some Serbian <laughs> media that are pro-government tabloids and that are financed by the state budget. And I can just name one case. On the day of the start of the war in Ukraine, Informer, locally owned Serbian pro-government tabloid, ran a story on the front page that said that Ukraine attacked Russia. So this is the level of disinformation that we are, we are dealing with, and it has nothing to do with the Russian influence or propaganda it's by the local state actors uh, in, uh, in the region. Um, so many more things to, to, to discuss about the, the, the way this relationship works. Maybe we can do that in the discussion, but just to go back uh, to the EU integration. Uh, and potential way out of it and how, how it fits into the, the picture. This year is two decades since we've uh, been promised European perspective, to refer to what Mr. Saracen said. There was the Thessaloniki summit in 2003, and all of the Western Balkan countries 
were given green light. Potentially, you could join the EU if you follow if you follow through with the uh, with the reforms. Not many did join. So we have Slovenia, which was already uh, joined in 2004. Then then Croatia joined in 2013. And since 2013, we didn't have any new enlargement waves. So this this has been the the the, the biggest period of time, the longest period of time without enlargement of the EU since the 70s, when the UK, Ireland, and Denmark joined. So we've had 10 years without enlargement, and not only that, we had. Uh, the EU has shrunk. The, uh, we had Brexit uh, in the meantime. So something is definitely not working. Sorry? Yes, <laughs> 2013, but they were like, it, it, it got, uh, the number of the members got lower by one. So something is not working with the enlargement and the conditionality, and we know this. Um, Serbia started accession talks in 2014. We've been negotiating for more than nine years now. We are nowhere close to full membership of, of the EU. And obviously, there have, everybody knows this, and people are talking about this. And there were several ideas on how to kind of get out of this uh, uh, situation. And we've had this French proposal about the new methodology. So we've had chapters, benchmarks. Now we have clusters. Uh, there are different ideas, uh, Jordan mentioned, that about some, what, what is now called sectoral or stage accession, where instead of spending decades of negotiating with little results and then eventually you get the big prize at the end, you actually break the accession into sectors or stages where you, as you gradually become closer to the EU and you align, you might, for example, get access to more funds, like Jordan mentioned. And this is something that has taken some root in policymaking circles. But I think the most important thing for the accession would be to actually reform the voting system that would go, to, that would go into the qualified majority voting. Uh, this is, I think, the that's only thing that could, that, that's, that's a contentious thing, yeah, I would assume uh, my Bulgarian colleague would uh, disagree with this. But yeah, this is something that, that has been proposed as well, and this is potentially the only way that we could uh, uh, get out of this uh, gridlock. And uh, definitely, Mr. Saracin mentioned perspective. Perspective, unfortunately, doesn't mean much. Um, we, the, uh, last year, we've had uh, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, you know, getting perspective and get, getting into the group of the Western Balkan countries. So now there are, there are more of us who are nego negotiating accession. But the credibility is still lacking. And I think this is very visible in the Western Balkans. If you, for example, ask people in Serbia, um, now, most, more people would be concerned if Serbia introduced sanctions to Russia than if we left EU accession talks, if we stopped, uh, stopped uh, integration, EU integration process. So, and I will leave it at that at this time, and maybe later we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boyan. Actually, uh, if there is one country uh, that is older than you in this endeavor of uh, negotiate, uh, negotiation uh, accession, from the Western Balkans is Montenegro that started it in 2012. Uh, Serbia has opened 22 chapters out of 35, but uh, I think the European Union managed to uh, gain some new impetus with the Western Balkans in the last year, considering, uh, considering Bosnia and Herzegovina, considering also uh, Albania and North Macedonia, and also we know that uh, uh, Bulgaria was able to be convinced to support opening a negotiation agreement. Um, one thing that the Western Balkans and the UK have in common is that they are not members of the European Union. And um, I would like now to move to uh, Mr. James Go, Professor James Go from the Department of War Studies, King's College UK, uh, to hear his, uh, his presentation. Please, James, you have the floor. Thank you, Robert. I am going to try to make three points in relation to the, to the proposed mission of the impact of Ukraine on the Western Balkans, uh, with a footnote to the wider Balkans as well, at one point. Uh, the first and last will be quite short. The problem will be the middle bit, so shut me up if I'm going on too long. There's too much packed into it. The first point is the psychological effect that it's had. Uh, I've been in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular a few times, uh, and the shock is one of post-traumatic stress. People are shaken. The events of the 1990s have come back to people. There's a lot of nervousness, uh, effects on mental health, and that translates into destabilizing elements in p political insecurity environments. And I think I'll start just by registering that and saying that it may run through some of the other things as well, to be noted. The second point uh, is about security and strategy. 
Uh, and the footnote on the wider Balkans is that one impact of Ukraine has been to boost defense industries across Central and Eastern Europe, uh, especially in Bulgaria, but also in Croatia and in Serbia, uh, even when they're saying that they're not particularly supporting things. Uh, there have been several things that have shown the fragility. In North Macedonia, around the discussion on the agreement about the name arrangement and prospective EU membership, Russia was clearly able to prod and probe uh, and create instability around that question. It came through in the end, but it shows the underlying fragility. Uh, the big question in many respects from the start of the wider enlarged uh, massive operations is, are the dogs that did not bark. Uh, and there was a lot of expectation, as Boyan just mentioned, uh, that in Kosovo or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Russia would carry out destabilizing operations. Uh, and they were clearly prepared to do so. Uh, Kosovo was on high readiness uh, because the actions went so badly, all of that was pulled back. But they remain as options because I think echoing Boyan as well, Moscow's main interest is to be a nuisance. And so they keep things in place to be a nuisance uh, if, if they can. Uh, the disruption that would have occurred through the, the Serbs in, in northern Kosovo is one thing. Disruption through the Serbs, the Republic of Srpska in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina is another. And I will note that, the, that, that this meeting comes a few days early because uh, RS uh, uh, President Milorad Dodik is about to go to Moscow again next week uh, unless somebody manages to stop him. He's been told by the EU not to go. It's not a friendly action. Uh, but Dodik has spent more time in Moscow than he has in Sarajevo in the past few years. He's only made two trips to Sarajevo, so far as I know. Uh, his orientation is there. He's part of the, Bel of the Moscow uh, security destabilizing apparatus. Uh, all of this, and I come back to the point about the psychological impact of, of the wider conflict in Ukraine, uh, is destabilizing. It leaves an impression of fragility. In Montenegro, uh, again, we're a, a day early, or I'm a day early, because there'll be a, 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 a new president tomorrow for the end of the Dukanovic era. Uh, and uh, it, what is that going to begin? Yakov Milatovic, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, is more friendly towards Serbia than Dukanovic ever was. Uh, but on the other, he makes positive noises. He's supported sanctions around Ukraine uh, 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 and supported Ukraine broadly. But we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if you take into account the amount of Russian investment in Montenegro and the capacity for destabilization, destabilization that that brings, uh, and those of you who can go back as far as 2016 and know about the assassination attempt against Dukanovic, you can only say, you know, it, it, it's not a picture that's re reassuring for now. Uh, and of course, uh, Montenegro is the one country on this list which is a member of NATO. Uh, and as a member of NATO, it, it's in a fairly strange position now being surrounded by p political forces that are more anti-NATO than pro-NATO uh, and with the capacity uh, to be penetrated. And of course, the big questions come around Serbia and around Belgrade. Uh, first, uh, in the past decade, Moscow, I would, if it's not too strong a word, I would say has penetrated the Belgrade military security apparatus. Uh, uh, a decade ago, I had lots of very lovely, friendly generals who were friends, pro-Western, uh, including the one who outwitted NATO through his decoy missions in the 1999 bombings. Yeah, these people have all been squeezed out. They've been squeezed out in favor of those who are either placed by Moscow or in favor with Moscow. Uh, that leaves President Vucic in a position where he's surrounded and has very limited room for, room for maneuver uh, at, at those levels, uh, however much he continues to favor an EU path pathway for Serbia. So that's an, a significant question. That reflects also the divisions within Serbian society. A attitudes are divided. Boyan mentioned 
probably more likely to be in favor of, of resisting sanctions on, on Russia than joining the EU at the moment. Uh, that doesn't help in these situations because Belgrade is the key, it's the linchpin to future security and to the strategy for getting peace and stability in the region eventually. That has to come through Serbia's accession to the EU. That has been stalled first by the migration crisis, then by the Brexit distractions, uh, and now by Ukraine. Uh, it's gone nowhere for a long time, as has been noted. Uh, once that happens, Dodik, the Republic of Srpska, will have to change its position because of the new border. Got time to finish, one minute to go. Um, uh, so I'll hurry. Uh, and with all of this, any agreement that will affect will affect uh, Serbia, EU, into Bosnia and Herzegovina has to get past Kosovo. And Kosovo is a major obstacle. Uh, the recent decision to approve a vote to consider Kosovo's membership of, 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 of the Council of Europe has left Belgrade angry. Uh, and that's in a number of the other issues raising this. Uh, in the words of one of my very astute friends and colleagues is that it's a boiling point. My third point, I will just put out there is in-betweenness. Uh, on all of this, in the fragility, in the positioning of Milatovic, Milatovic, in the position that Belgrade has, the region is in-between. So when we say a, a crossroads, it is at a crossroad because it's literally in-between on all those questions. A bit as Tito and Serbia was during the Cold War with the non-aligned movement, uh, but with important roles to play perhaps in future diplomacy, maybe through the OSCE, whenever the time comes when diplomacy is going to be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, for your presentation. Thank you all for your initial presentations. Before uh, moving to the, to the hall, to the panel, um, I would have one question because uh, you all mentioned the enlargement process. You all mentioned the, the situation between Serbia and Kosovo. And uh, James, you lastly mentioned the fact that Serbia is the linchpin to the future security and stability of, of the region. So, uh, common question to all of you. Um, President Vucin announced recently after uh, the, uh, the idea of Kosovo joining the, council, the ranks of the Council of Europe that um, this will have a profound and fundamental change to Serbia's foreign policy. Uh, we don't know yet what are those uh, pre-announced uh, profound changes, but um, how will this affect uh, Serbia's path to the EU and the path of the entire region to the EU? Who wants to jump first? Um, I can try. So, uh, yes, I mean, the situation in Serbia is somewhat difficult to, to understand to the untrained eye from, from outside. So uh, definitely uh, uh, when Kosovo applied uh, to join the Council of Europe, this was in line with the agreement that was signed in February and then the uh, roadmap was agreed in March in, in, in Ohrid. Uh, so Serbia basically accepted that Kosovo can become part of international uh, organizations. But today uh, there is a summit in Reykjavik taking place of the Council of Europe and Serbia decided not to send a high representative. There is only ambassador who said that Serbia will rethink the purpose and meaningfulness of its membership in Council of Europe. This has happened just today, so I, I mean, I, I cannot say what it, what it means, but what I know for sure is that our president is a master of gaslighting, and I think what James mentioned here, I need to reflect this, just to give you, uh, uh, it's, it, 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 this is what a lot of untrained eyes from, from outside think that, the, that Russia penetrated Serbia and that President Vucic has been surrounded by some pro-Russian agents, like Vulin, for example, who met with Petrushev many times, who had been Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense, and is now is heading our intelligence agency. These people have zero political capital. They are placed there. This is by design. They are placed there by Vucic, so he can portray himself as being surrounded by Russian agents, and he cannot you know, get rid of them, so that he can balance this out between Russia and the West. So to the untrained eye from the West, he say, oh, I'm the only one who can keep Serbia's head above and you know, outside of Russia's stranglehold, whereas towards Putin, he communicates that he's the one who keeps Serbia outside of the West. And this is a very skillful 
play gaslighting, basically, that he's managed to pull uh, for the past decade that he's been. And this is mostly doing because uh, of, of his desire to stay in power. But when it comes to the, this, global sh this uh, big shift in Serbian policy, there have been many uh, instances of uh, people announcing this. Uh, I'm not sure if you follow, but there have been two mass, mass shootings in Serbia early May. Uh, and this led into uh, some political upheaval, uh, large-scale protests, the largest in a couple, in in couple of years by the opposition parties have taken place. And for the 26th of May, the president announced the biggest counter-protest, and the aim is to gather 500,000 people in Belgrade from all around Serbia. And then he announced that on the 27th, the next day, there will be a big announcement of what is going to take place next. So nobody knows what this is about. We can just uh, uh, guess, but we might expect some shift in the upcoming 10 or so days. Who wants to jump in, please, Jordan? Uh, just observation uh, of a neighboring country. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, we would like to see at least the process of normalization of, of uh, relations. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, the process uh, which uh, was supported uh, by European Union of uh, having at least meetings and debates, uh, it is very positive. Uh, we consider it as a first uh, mm, uh, uh, way to reduce the tension on, uh, in the region and second to prevent uh, Russia playing a spoiler uh, on the Balkans because Russia is playing on these uh, disputes uh, or uh, um, uh, issues, unresolved issues like uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, or uh, what's happening in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. But um, let me add one more idea here. Uh, having in mind again the conflict uh, in, in, in Ukraine, um, I think that countries that aspire to be a members uh, of EU has to have a very clear assessment of Russia and its uh, uh, aggressive war uh, against uh, Ukraine. You cannot afford to integrate, uh, I mean, countries uh, that could have uh, potentially different assessments. So European Union cannot afford uh, to bring uh, uh, countries which could potentially divide the unity uh, of the European Union. Thank you. James? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, on that last point, I think we, we have to be clear that if the prospect were seriously there of the EU pathway, then Belgrade's positions would also more clearly be on that side. But it's left in a situation where it's in between uh, and it's not going to cut off ties that may bring some things, the same with China which brings a lot more, but also has a lot more penalties for them, uh, uh, w w until it's sure of the pathway. And I think that's one of the difficulties here, that everything is stuck. Um, uh, on a couple of things that Boyan said, uh, I absolutely agree that Vucic is a master, uh, but I have a fairly well-trained eye, if I may say so, and I've been operating it for a long time. And what I said about penetration <laughs> comes from personal experience and information, and I will stand by that very strongly. Uh, uh, and the second thing, and that came wrong, is you said about polling showing that nobody thinks, or not many, yeah, it was uh, I will tell you, in the spring of 1991, I went round all the Yugoslav lands, and nobody imagined that there could be an armed conflict, let alone one like the one that came. Some people said, well, there might be a bit of an unrest. Uh, except for the ones I had the chance to meet who were planning it. And I think in those situations, what people feel and think may well be different from what some people are thinking and planning and being prepared to do. Uh, did I answer your question, I think? I think you managed to. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, we would like to open the floor for questions from the, from the audience. Please. Uh, Raise your hand, your, your affiliation, and whom do you address the question? I, uh, no, I think the, the lunch break was pretty good for insightful uh, informal talks, so I think we can manage to, if not already, uh, we'll move to another round of, um, of questions from, from my side. Uh, we discussed Russia. 
and its influence uh, on Belgrade's position, uh, in, but also in other countries, we should consider the fact that in the Western Balkans we have countries like Montenegro, like North Macedonia, and like Albania that are members of, uh, of NATO. So that's an important part coming for myself from, from a country that firstly joined NATO and afterwards the European Union. After, actually, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, it was a precondition of joining the EU, then firstly being a part of, uh, of NATO. So there is a path over there. But uh, I saw in your, in your remarks just very, very few uh, mentions about China. We know that we are uh, heading to a strategic competition uh, between democracies and autocracies. We know that we will not have a whole European Union, even institutional, but let's also say uh, uh, at, as part of a political community, a not a very well unified continent, if the Western Balkans will be in between. Um, how would you assess uh, China's influence in the region? And how would you assess um, uh, the needs for the European Union to act better in this I would not say contest of beauty, but I would say contest of uh, uh, offering the best possibilities for the Western Balkan citizens. The question goes to all of you, of course. Um, we, st we studied China's influence uh, in, uh, in Southeast Europe, and this year we published a study together with Friedrich Naumann Foundation, uh, which is called uh, China's Secret Charm in, uh, in Southeast uh, Europe. Uh, there, there were uh, expectations from countries in the region that uh, countries could attract Chinese investment, that China uh, will contribute to the economic development uh, in the region. But I think that uh, in the last year we, we see an awakening that China is uh, not uh, that benign monster which will, uh, you know, bring a lot of investment. China's interests are uh, uh, in different uh, uh, spheres, I mean mainly to sell its uh, products, etc., etc., etc. So uh, this is one observation. Another uh, observation is that China is changing its behavior uh, in the region. Uh, uh, if you take 10 years ago, China uh, tried to sign agreements on highest political level with different countries to, uh, I mean, regulate uh, relations. Currently, China is working under the radars. Uh, what I mean? For example, uh, several years ago, China proposed to Polish government to sign uh, an agreement uh, to medical checks of pregnant women uh, based on very high uh, tech uh, medical equipment, etc., etc., etc. And Polish government said, oh no, uh, it is about uh, public security, safety, uh, data protection, etc., etc., etc. What we discovered uh, last month in Bulgaria, Chinese company, the same high-tech Chinese company, signed contracts with medical universities in Bulgaria without informing Bulgarian government, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or Ministry of Education, or Ministry of Health, and they got the same samples, they, they do the same what they wanted uh, to do on a uh, very high political level in, in Poland. So I think uh, China is changing its, uh, its behavior, uh, trying again to protect its interests in different spheres, and I would say again, uh, selling its products uh, or um, uh, bringing construction companies, etc., etc., etc. Please, James. Boyan. From my, from my perspective, the, uh, China has been engaged on a strategic program, uh, a, a, a true strategic program of placing things, uh, uh, not just in the Balkans, not just in the Western Balkans, uh, all around the world and in parts of what we call Western Europe as well. Uh, and what it's been doing is putting in place purchases and activities which are the building blocks both to hold hold some uh, uh, to have a hold over countries at some stage but most of all to create the space 
for a single economic and political space ra ranging all the way across the, the Northern Hemisphere and possibly into the Southern Hemisphere as well, uh, which will be a bit like the European Union, except it won't be voluntary built up, but it will be de facto through putting all of these things in place uh, uh, until a point where it's too late for anybody to do anything about it and go back, or, or too late, apart from at such a great cost that they probably wouldn't bear. So I think that, to me, is fairly clear, and China is very active on many, many levels. Uh, I can't say I know it's true, but I've heard that it's responsible for 50% of the pro-Russian information that's circulating, for example, in the Western Balkans or in other places. Uh, not that it's particularly wanting to support and back Russia, but it's wanting to keep things in that space of openness and uncertainty. Uh, away from China, I felt I hadn't answered your question before, so if I may, I'll go back to that, because you mentioned the Council of Europe, and I think it's important to understand the vote was only to consider making Kosovo a member, but that will probably move ahead. Uh, and for Serbia, it was quite a shock because not only Ukraine, with which it's allied because of territorial integrity issues, but a number of other countries which had previously supported its position either abstained or actively, vote, actively voted against. Uh, and so Serbia is a bit shaken by this position. What it can do, I think none of us really knows, because in the end it'll have to keep something of the relations going. But I do think that it's, an, uh, it's a negative step, and I'm not sure it's one that people should have been pushing forward so quickly myself. China. So uh, people say that uh, this is the uh, about Russian influence. Yeah, it's been talked a lot, and this seems to be the last blow of a dying empire. But Chinese influence is under research, under reported, and it is here to stay. So Belt and Road Initiative, yes, is very much alive. Serbia again is uh, the biggest recipient of funds and investments coming from China, and we did quite a extensive research about Chinese investment in Serbia, for example. They pretty much dug up the whole of eastern Serbia. They bought mining rights. They bought a Serbian steel industry opening tire factories in Vojvodina. And their approach here is we come with money, no strings attached, and they've uh, invested in Serbian infrastructure projects. Because Chinese companies are building highways, uh, water treatment facilities across Serbia. And the influence of China is not corrosive in the sense of undermining uh, democracy and you know, pro-Western attitudes so far, but uh, it's toxic in terms of human rights and uh, labor rights, and in terms of e ecological devastation that is taking place in Serbia. For example, in Smenderevo, where a Chinese company bought a steel mill, if you go to the, in the vicinity of the steel mill, there is iron dust that falls on houses and the leaves, on the cars. You, you can wipe it and see it's, it's in the air. It's really Maida Pekinbor, the areas in the eastern part of Serbia, completely devastated by Chinese mining operation. Uh, there were 500 Vietnamese workers basically in the trafficked uh, uh, workers uh, without any proper permits found on the sites of Chinese uh, construction companies. Uh, there are reports that Chinese prisoners were being sent to Serbia to work in these uh, large-scale uh, Chinese projects. So this is something that is under-researched, but it, this is a big issue, and this is going to be much more difficult to, 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 in the long term, address these, these issues. This is just briefly, I mean, in, in Montenegro is similar. They almost went bankrupt because of the Chinese loan that they took out, or like almost a billion euros for a highway that leads to nowhere. They managed to refinance it, but this is a trap that is, you know, just, just there waiting to... <laughs> That's what I meant by having a hold of it. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. From the audience, questions? We have one over there and one over there. Please, Mrs. Liana Popescu first. And I think we can collect all the questions over there. As far as I know, um, in Serbia, it was not very widely known by the citizens the fact that the European Union invested and offered lots of money to Serbia, as compared with uh, Russia, for example. So under the circumstances, <clears throat> 
My question is, uh, what would be, in your view, in your opinion, <clears throat> uh, what would be the good reason for Serbians to choose the EU and uh, becoming EU member, which comes with strings attached conditionality, over uh, rapprochement and, and closeness to China? Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the other one over there. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Ahmed Dekint. Uh, I'm from the French Embassy in Romania. Um, on the 1st of June, uh, Moldova will host a um, um, summit of the European political community, a recent initiative um, that is uh, conceived as not an, uh, an alternative to enlargement, but uh, sort of an accompanying process. Uh, bringing together members of the European family, whether EU member states, candidates, and others such as the UK and Switzerland. I was wondering if uh, one of your speakers has any um, uh, ideas, opinions on what uh, opportunities such uh, a format could bring to the WB6. Thank you. Thank you. Please, all of you, both questions. Mr. James, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Because uh, it touches your answer about... Uh, on on EU, EU investment uh, in Serbia and why would they vote, uh, I, I can't say that they would, but if they were well informed, then they would. And the one thing to note is that there's a big division. Those who are younger and in living in urban areas are very much for the EU path. Those who live in, uh, in the provinces very much not, and it's a question of how do you get the messages to those people. Uh, and on the amount of investment, but people don't know it, the same was true of the UK, and that's probably why they're both outside, <laughs> and one reason why they're both outside the EU at the moment. The European political community, you know, the answer in the first instance is only to bring everybody into the same conversation. Uh, once they're in the same conversation, then maybe you can work out where else to go. Jordan? Um, on EPC, I think it's good to have inclusive formats when, uh, where uh, all like-minded countries can sit together and discuss uh, uh, issues of common interest. Um, uh, but uh, the idea still creates uh, mixed feelings. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, some would uh, assess EPC as a kind of mechanism instead of enlargement. Uh, I would prefer to see it as a first step of enlargement. But again, uh, there should be more clarity. And as I uh, started with uh, some ideas, I would prefer to follow uh, the, the concept of gradual um, accession, uh, uh, which will bring uh, countries uh, closer and closer and participate, start participating in decision-making mechanisms, contributing uh, to the EU uh, policies already from the uh, negotiation stage. Thank you. Yes, please, James. Yeah, just to jump in on that. Uh, it, it, it's a complete mistake to see it in terms of accession. Yeah, it's what the UK will be part of it, but no question of accession for a long time, I think. So that's the... I mean, it may have some contributions in that role, but it's going to be a wider conversation with those who are not. It on was the announced process. already that yeah. uh, uh, yeah. this issue will be discussed yes, during I, the next course. meeting. Well, well, yeah, of course, I, but I think it's. I do think that uh, that very important uh, uh, is the uh, June 22 Council decision, the, the European Council conclusions that stated. <laughs> the founding of the European political community and it also that it, it will not be a back channel uh, to the European integration of the Western Balkans or, or if it, it will affect it. Uh, moving back to the question of uh, Mrs. Liana Popescu to you, Boyan, and also please uh, uh, answer also the question on European political community. Yeah. Yeah, it, this is a, a very long-standing problem in Serbia. All public opinion polls show that Serbs think that some other countries uh, are uh, supporting Serbia more than the EU, which is the biggest donor. Uh, this is true. This has to do again with the government and the, the way it's communicated. The EU cannot compete with the capacities of the Serbian pro-government tabloids in the media when it comes to communication. There are all the posters 
Everywhere where the EU spends money, there is a sign, a billboard, but this simply cannot keep up with the Serbian government uh, uh, information warfare, if I may say so. For example, during Corona, for one month, the EU suspended export of PPE equipment to the Western Balkans. After one week, they corrected it, and then we were included back. But during this week, our presidents came out to the public television station, said, European solidarity is dead. We cannot count on the EU anymore. The only thing, the only people who we can trust is Chinese. And then in Chinese language, in Mandarin, he learned these sentences, said that Chinese are Serbian brothers, went to the airport and accepted PPE equipment from China. The public opinion poll we did that, that year in October showed that Ch China came on top as the biggest friend of Serbia in the world, before Russia even. So this is how it works. And you, the EU simply cannot compete with that. Uh, so you need to have pro-European government, I have to say so, that is clearly and strategically communicated the benefits of joining the EU. This is the only way to do, to do so. And about the EPC, when this idea first came into existence recently, uh, I gave a very harsh statement in the Serbian media. I was summoned to the French embassy to explain myself and I said it was a terrible idea, but then in the embassy I said it's the second terrible idea after the met new methodology for enlargement, which basically blocked the uh, 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 North Macedonian accession for two years. Later, I mean, they, now they have these other bilateral issues. But I mean, uh, now I stand corrected. It's not a terrible idea. My concern at the time was with all these new initiatives, we would lose what the essence of the EU enlargement is. It's to bring countries closer to Europe and to democratize them. And with this new methodology, stage accession, EPC, it feels like EU enlargement has been decoupled from democratization, which has been the case before. And I think it's democracy that we need to, we need to fix. Yes, it's okay to have wider forums that you know, they are in favor of geopolitical kind of cooperation and let's you know, count each other and like, who belongs to what team. But I think the essence of the enlargement and the conditionality should be democracy and the rule of law. And this kind of seems to be lost in this, all, of, all of these new initiatives. Thank you very much, uh, Boyan. Uh, I don't think we have time, but if, if it's a short question, very, short. very, very short, please. Thank you. My name is Valentin Berk. I am the representative of Berekapa Systems Company from Kreva. Uh, my uh, sh very short question is uh, what are your opinions regarding integration of uh, Western Balkans in TRIS initiative? Because TRIS initiative uh, means uh, Baltic Sea, Black Sea and Adriatic Sea. On Adriatic Sea is only Slovenia and Croatia, but uh, Albania, Montenegro, NATO members. Uh, this initiative m means uh, integration related uh, energy, communication and transport. And digital, yes. European Union uh, launch, uh, launched the uh, ESTR, a new... Thank uh, you. <coughs> one, one, uh, one idea, please. Way, 10 please. T, 10T for uh, Western Balkans, 10T transport uh, network for uh, Ukraine and for Moldova. Thank you. Thank you very much, if I may, and if everyone will, will, will let me. The Three Seas Initiative is, is an initiative for member countries within the European Union. So all the 12 uh, member countries within the Three Seas Initiative are members of the European Union. But the 10T uh, project for the Western Balkans, I think it will, can build a very good in, uh, infrastructure. Uh, we do not have uh, time uh, now, but uh, thank you for your interventions. Thank you, Boyan. Thank you, James. Thank you, Jordan, for, uh, for being together with us today. I, I think we laid the, the ground for the next panel that will we'll start in five minutes after a technical break. And the panel would be, uh, what will the security architecture look like after the war? How can we restore stability in Europe? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day and fruitful debates. Thank you.